king is anointed and is dressed in the cloth of gold super tunica, he is then seated in St Edward's chair and he is ready to be invested with the royal regalia. There are really two parts to the investiture and I'm going to treat them separately in two videos. The first part of the investiture, which this video will be all about, has its origin in the medieval ceremonies associated with the creation of knights. A medieval knight was created through a fourfold process. Firstly, they took a bath to symbolically wash away their sins, and then put on a white robe like that of baptism. Secondly, they had spurs placed on their heels. Thirdly, a sword was girded at their waist, and lastly, they were dubbed. In the early Middle Ages, the dubbing, the adoubement, a word that means to strike, involved getting a good old slap around the face from the king or the lord, and not flinching while you were receiving it. But in the later Middle Ages, that dubbing was replaced with a strike from a sword, called the accolade, in which a sword is gently placed by the lord or king on one shoulder and then on the next. Now two of these elements of knight making are present in the investiture at the coronation. The giving of the spurs and the girding with the sword. But as the king is the fount of knighthood and honour, a dubbing does not take place. But rather the king, while being invested with these symbols of knighthood, is addressed by the Archbishop of Canterbury as to how he should conduct himself as the fountain of chivalry, honour and justice. Now the first element of the making of knights was also present historically in the coronation preparations. In the Liber Regalis of the 14th century, early in the morning of the day of the coronation, the king was instructed to rise and to bathe and then put on new clean white clothes. Now the king had been in the Tower of London until the day before the coronation and while there he had created a whole series of Knights of the Bath who had gone through this whole process of creation including the bathing. So the king at his coronation was in effect going through the same process they had been through. Now I'm, I'm sure that we were told that the new ritual for the coronation this year would be slimmed down but it hasn't been. And this part of the ritual is in fact longer now than it was previously. There are more words for the Archbishop to say and the ritual itself has in no way been curtailed. Firstly, while seated in the chair, St Edward's chair, the King is offered the spurs. The spurs of gold used in the ceremony on Saturday were made for the coronation of Charles II in 1661 by Robert Viner. They are prick spurs of a form that fell out of use in the 14th century. By the 15th century spurs had little spiked wheels called rowels on them. When the regalia was remade in 1661 Charles II was adamant that the new spurs were to be of the same form as the old which indicates that the spurs used at the medieval coronation ceremony were very ancient. The spurs are brought from the altar by the Dean of Westminster and they are delivered to the Lord Great Chamberlain. Now in the Middle Ages the spurs were attached to the feet of a male sovereign but since the restoration they have simply been touched to the heels of the king by the chamberlain. Queen Regnants have simply touched the spurs before sending them back to the altar. Lord Carrington is the current Lord Chamberlain and he will offer the spurs to the king the new liturgy says that the king will then acknowledge the spurs, so he may just touch them like his mother did before sending them back to the altar. We will have to see if Lord Carrington kneels to touch them to the king's heels. The offering of the spurs was traditionally done in silence at previous coronations, but on Saturday the Archbishop of Canterbury will address the king and he will explain the meaning of the spurs, that they are symbols of honour and courage and he will pray that the king may be a brave advocate for those in need. After the presentation of the spurs comes the presentation of a sword. Now before I get to that I want to talk about the swords used in coronations in general 
for during the course of the ceremony, five different swords will be in evidence. During the opening procession, four swords are carried before the king, representing the authority of the sovereign as the fount of all justice. There are three identical swords that are carried three abreast, more of them in a moment, and then a larger sword that is called the Sword of State. The Sword of State, which will be carried on Saturday for the first time in coronation history by a woman, by the Lord President of the Privy Council, the MP Penny Mordaunt, is carried in front of the Sovereign whenever the Sovereign moves from place to place in the Abbey during the first part of the ceremony. During the oath, the sword is held directly to the Sovereign's right as they sit in the chair of estate, and when they move for the recognition and then the anointing, the sword is borne before them. In times past, even within the royal palaces, the king would go nowhere without a sword of state going before him, and there were two swords of state made at the end of the 17th century. One made in 1660 that was used domestically within the palaces, and the other, the one that we'll see used on Saturday, which was made in 1678 for outdoor use. So what are the other three swords carried in the procession? Well, when the king gets to the chair of the state, these three swords are held unsheathed to the right of the sword of state, and you have a little line of four sword bearers standing there. I've been racking my brains how to explain what they mean in a straightforward manner. Well, these three swords, which are only used at the coronation, are an unpacking of the triple meaning of the sword of state itself. They represent in visual form the three symbolic aspects of royal authority and kingly virtue that are usually, in other circumstances, represented by the single sword of state. The three swords are the sword of spiritual justice, which represents the king's virtue as the protector of the church, the sword of temporal justice that represents the king's virtue as the arbiter of secular law. And the third one, the sword of mercy, is also known as katana, which means a shortened sword, as it has a flattened tip, and it represents the king's virtue as a merciful prince, exercising justice with mercy. The use of all these swords at the coronation seems to date from that of Richard I first in 1189. Now these three swords we will see were provided for the coronation of Charles I in 1626 and they survived the Commonwealth by being sold to Roger Humphreys who then returned them to the crown after the restoration. So let's get back to the ritual and the presentation of the sword to the king. After the presentation of the spurs there is then a funny little ceremony in which the sword of state is relinquished by its bearer and then is exchanged for another sword. As the choir sings an anthem, we will see the Lord President of the Council present the Sword of State to the Lord Great Chamberlain, who will then take it into St Edward's Chapel behind the High Altar. He will then reappear bearing another sword that's called the Sword of Offering in its scabbard, which will then be given to the Lord President. The Lord President will then offer this sword to the Archbishop of Canterbury, who will lay it down upon the altar. So why does this curious exchange of swords take place? The King is just about to be girded with the sword, and rather than being girded with an impractical and large sword like the Sword of State, in the Middle Ages he was girded with his own sword of more modest proportions. Once the swap has been made, the sort of offering has now become, in effect, the sword of state and continues in that role for the rest of the service. The tradition of the king using his own sword at this point continued until 1821 when King George IV had the present sort of offering made. It was so lavish that it became a permanent fixture. George had the sword made by Rundle, Bridge and Rundle and he paid for it himself out of the privy purse. 
typical George, he didn't spare any expense. It's a really lavish item. There's a, it has a narrow blade of blued and gilt steel, and it has a hilt and pommel of gold that's studded with diamonds and gems. It's not very practical in warfare. The leather scabbard is encased in gold and is decorated with roses, thistles and shamrocks, set with diamonds, rubies and emeralds. The sword was returned to George after the ceremony and it was not an official part of the regalia until 1902 when it was then placed in the jewel house by Edward VII. It has been used at every coronation since. The sword of offering having been presented to the archbishop is raised above the altar by him and in a prayer he then asks God to direct and support the king that he may not use the sword in vain but as God's minister he might resist evil and defend good. Then the sword is given to the Lord President who carries it to the king and it is then placed upright unsheathed in the king's right hand as though he is about to use it. The new words of the service at this point explain clearly that the sword is a sign and symbol not of judgment but of justice, not of might but of mercy. Then the king is girded with the sword. It is placed back in the scabbard and the sword is suspended from a sword belt or girdle and the king has chosen to use the belt of his grandfather George VI. The sword is clipped to his left side and then the king sits. The archbishop continues to address the king with words that are unaltered from 1953. He says that the sword reflects the king's role as the fountain of justice, that he is to protect his people and the church, to punish and reform, to stop iniquity growing, to restore his land, to maintain the things restored, to be glorious in all virtue. These are all knightly chivalric values and the purpose of the presentation of the spurs and the sword is to instruct the king symbolically about the very purpose of his role, a role he has sworn to undertake and has been anointed to perform, to be a servant of God and a protector of his nation. After that, the king rises from St Edward's chair and the sword is removed from his waist and he takes it in both hands directly to the altar. And having had it offered to him, he then offers the sword back to God. And in so doing, he symbolically offers all his worldly power and authority to God's service. The Dean of Westminster then places the sword back on the altar. In the Middle Ages, this offering of the sword was a genuine offer. The king was not expecting to get the sword back necessarily, so a tradition developed of the king redeeming it. The person who has the role of bearing the sword, this time Penny Mordaunt, will then come forward again and will place in an arms dish proffered by the Dean of Westminster a sum of money and she buys back the sword from the Dean. Traditionally, the price of the redemption was 100 silver shillings. Certainly it was in 1953. We don't know what it will be this year, though this ceremony has been retained. Having redeemed the sword, it is then drawn from the scabbard and is borne before the king in place of the sword of state for the rest of the service. So having taken the oath, been anointed in this part of the ceremony the king's responsibilities as the arbiter of justice in his realm are underlined and reinforced through the presentation of these symbols of chivalry and knighthood and the king is now ready to be invested with the symbols of his royal and imperial dignity and i will talk about those in the next video Thanks very much for watching. I've decided to publish a special coronation issue of the Antiquary magazine. This is an addition to the general monthly issue.
I have a large collection of really interesting old photographs that I've been collecting over the years of the coronations of George V, George VI and Elizabeth II. And to celebrate the King's coronation in May, this issue will be a special album looking back at the coronations of the 20th century. There is a link in the description and above to the website where you can pre-order a copy before the publishing date in early May.